Hi, I'm Chris Chimicles, president of Angie Group, and welcome to our Leading Litigator series. Our series brings together some of the best and brightest class action practitioners from both the plaintiffs and defense bars, and most importantly, the attorneys that made case law. Enjoy our series. Hi, I'm Steve Weisbrot. Thank you for joining us for another edition of Angian's Leading Litigator video series. It is our pleasure today to have uh, Steve Berman from Hoggins Berman, who's the managing partner and the founder, and it's our distinct pleasure to have you here. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for having me, and welcome to Seattle. Thank you. So clearly an impressive resume. Um, I think because of that, your insights as to a lot of the questions I'm going to ask you are particularly valuable as sort of a figurehead within the plaintiff's class action bar, and indeed you practice outside of that world also, correct? I do. You do. What do you like better? You mean between class actions and non-class actions? Yeah. Every case is different. I'm not sure that I have a favorite. So one of your cases that's been in the news recently is your case against the NCAA involving um, the difference between what students were promised a scholarship and what it actually cost to, um, to be a student at that school. Can, and I'm sure I kind of flubbed the factual background. Can you bring our viewers up to date as to what's going on with that case, why you think it's important, and where the litigation stands? Sure. So we filed a lawsuit a couple years ago alleging that the NCAA and its members conspired to fix the wages paid student athletes. And they set that at what's called the grant in aid amount, which was several thousand, if not up to five or six thousand dollars a year, less than what it actually cost kids to go to school. So our theory of the case was, absent the rule that you can only pay up to a certain amount, in a competitive environment, given the amount of money at stake in college football and basketball, these schools would pay full cost of attendance, if not more. Um, the, the court has certified an adjunctive relief class because we're seeking kind of rule changes that would allow more payment to student athletes, and we're in the midst of briefing the issue of a damage certification. So the B2 class, what, what is the precise change that's been um, undertaken? Well, what we want is, first of all, the court to rule that they cannot cap uh, payment at the grant and aid amount, that any attempt to, to cap the low cost of attendance is illegal. They've already, in, in response to our lawsuit, changed the rule um, to allow full cost of attendance, but without our lawsuit, it, if we go away, maybe they'll slip back, so we want that rule uh, stricken, and then we want uh, a free competitive environment where the schools will be allowed to give non-compensation, non-direct payments to student athletes. Uh, for example, maybe they get paid for graduate school. Maybe they get paid better health benefits. These are all issues that are out there that we think in a, a non-constrained world the schools would offer these kids. Okay. Now, as to the damages class, I've read some of the briefings and some of the articles about it, and it seems that the defendant's argument is there's too many particularized individual issues for it to receive class-wide treatment. Uh, wh wh what do you say about that? I'm pretty confident we'll get the damages certified. It's a, most, of, so the issue is which, whether the schools would have gone to full cost of attendance. And rather than just have a but-for world where the professor says, this is what I think the world would be, we actually have a real antitrust experiment going on here right. because they changed the rule. So we're able to track how many, uh, schools are going to full cost of attendance, and the majority of them, particularly in the Power Five conferences, are. To the extent there are a few that haven't, well, that's the lag effect of this, you know, decades old antitrust rule, and that's pretty well accepted in economics that there is a lag effect, so we think that highly likely we're gonna get a damage class certified. Understood. So, you obviously, file cases in lots of different areas, antitrust, ERISA, consumer, specifically automotive. Is there a particular area that you feel most passionate about, that you enjoy the cases more than others, or? I like them all, you know? It, it, they're all, the, the essential element is you're trying to uncover and deal with the wrongdoing, and the wrongdoings are always challenging, intellectually and emotionally. So it doesn't matter whether it's a securities case or an antitrust case. Right. Um, you know, it, it's, it's the uh, wrongdoing that makes it interesting. Steve, we've had a, a chance to discuss briefly the idea of not enough class members claiming the relief available to them. And I know that's something you feel passionate about. And I want to ask you to kind of give our viewers your thoughts on that, both on the causes and some possible solutions. Then I'm going I'm to ask you about some more specific ideas that I had on that front. 
So I think uh, what I feel passionately about and what I've tried to convey to courts is that one of the knocks on the class action bar is the lawyers, they, they reach a settlement for X dollars, they get their cut and they walk away. And they don't really care how the settlement's administered. And so what happens is the actual money doesn't go to consumers. It often reverts back to the defendant, it goes to charities. And so we've spent a lot of time trying to uh, actually get money into the pockets of consumers. There's a lot there. I mean, the, cr the critics, the, the Ted Franks of the world would say, well, if that's the case, why aren't we all structuring our settlements um, as an automatic payment? Is that an imped impediment to settlement? Well, that, is that an unrealistic uh, criticism? Is it, is it just an intellectual bubble, or is that a real criticism? It's a valid criticism, and um, our first attack when we're trying to settle a case right now is to demand automatic payment. You know, if you can do it, why not write a check directly to the consumer? Ultimately, that's what we did in, in one part of the Toyota case. Right. And not only did we write a check, but then when we had a certain amount of uncashed checks, we gave those people another chance to cash it. And when they didn't cash it, then we prorated the money back to the people who actually cashed the check. So you did a second distribution to the original people who cashed the check out of the uncashed check. That's right. So all the money was gone by the end of the day. No, I think that's great. Has your firm used or considered using sort of non-traditional distribution methods? And what I mean by that are digital checks. We're doing, a, we're doing a big case now where class members are able to use PayPal as their distribution. And do you think that would have an effect on redemption rates? We are doing that. For example, in the eBooks case, you got an automatic credit on whoever, whether you had an Amazon account or some other book distributor account, you got a credit, you didn't have to do anything, okay? And so in other cases, we're working on automatic wireless payments that may be tied to an email, for example. Right. So I think that, I think the wave of the future is to try to get away from printed notice um, uh, and go toward more social media, uh, stuff that people are interacting with these days. Well, I write extensively on that subject. It's, uh, it's one of my causes. I personally believe that, you know, we're in a world where 57% of Americans check their cell phone within the first five minutes of getting out of bed, uh, and that over half of Americans identify as being addicted to their digital devices, that because of a vestige of this concept of reach percentage that has kind of pervaded the court's doctrinal view of notice, we're kind of forced um, by, by the jurisprudence to use these antiquated methods. Do you have any solutions as to how we get past that, how we move into this next generation? It, it takes effort by the lawyers to talk to the judges about this. And I think the judges are receptive, because I know from talking to them that they're going to these uh, MDL conferences, they're talking about class actions, they're talking about how do we you know, be more effective in reaching people. So it just takes education and a willingness to, to talk about non-traditional methods. That's great to hear. Another question that I wanted to ask you involved um, your case selection process. There's a lot of firms in this country that have to take what comes in the door. Um, I would obviously estimate you are not one of those firms. And you get to have some, some forethought into where you want to target your efforts. What, what, kind, what goes into that process? Uh, well, cases come in one of two ways. You know, traditional way, you get an email or a phone call from someone, and then we evaluate, is that the kind of case that um, I'm interested in? You know, there's certain kinds of cases I just don't want to do, like data breach cases. Right. Um, uh, the company offers you credit program. I don't think the lawyers are actually doing anything worthwhile in those data breach cases, so I stay out of those. So we try to find cases where, um, it's going to make a difference to someone, right? On that same token, I read on your website that one of the reasons that you founded the firm is that you weren't happy about your previous firm refusing to take a particular case. Can you talk about that? Sure. So I was at a firm that was mainly a defense firm, and I handled all their contingent work. And we had a, a serious E. coli outbreak, probably the first in the country, at a restaurant called Jack in the Box. I don't know if you have them where you guys are, but there's a lot here. And I had a... Uh, family come in, they had a five-year-old kid who lost a kidney and his life was in danger. My kid was five years old, my oldest son. And I could envision, there go for the grace of you know, luck, he could have been him eating that um, burger. 
so I brought it to the attention of the um, firm's management, and they said, no, we might get hired by an insurance company, right? And I said, look, if you guys are just in it for the bucks, I'm gonna make more money on this case, this is a substantial case, that you're gonna make at $120 an hour for some insurance company. And they said, no, we don't wanna anger the insurance company. And I said, I'm out of here. So I went to law school to help people, families like this. Great. So of all the things you've done in your career, um, what, are you, what are you most proud of? Or what are you, what are you proud of lately? Oh, lately, lately. okay. Yeah. Uh, it's probably the NCAA concussion case. So I brought a case against the NCAA um, for their lack of pro proper concussion management and to set up a medical monitoring program for all athletes who've been exposed to uh, concussions. And we're in the preliminary approval stage. We got a preliminary approval. And the reason I'm really proud of that is because I've handled recently some individual concussion cases that could have been prevented if they had treated these kids properly after the first impact. And those kids are ruined for life. I mean, they dropped out of school, um, they have antisocial behavior, and they're 22 years old. And so if the concussion protocols that are now gonna go into place prevent that from happening, you know, prevent a kid from having his life ruined, then there's no higher calling than I could have done as a lawyer, right? So I'm really proud of that case. That's great. Steve, this has been wonderful. I really appreciate your time and learning more about your practice and what makes you tick. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me.